Good is all. The quest for greater torque and ease of maintenance by use of an electric motor has been a long one in the realm of armored vehicles. It basically goes back to World War I. Look at this one of the French vehicles. Then the Americans and Germans tried it in World War II. Not exactly with huge success, but the, the theory was there. I mean, if you want to look at the benefits of an electric motor, just look at your typical American railroad locomotive today with an AC motor and the, the thing will haul ridiculous amounts of weight around quite well. Well, in the late 1970s, a Belgian company decided to have a crack at the problem, Atelier de Construction Electrique de Charleroi, which is a little bit south of Brussels. You, you don't need to know that. Suffice to say, they had to think to themselves, and so, well, can we make ourselves armored fighting vehicles with electric motors that work in today's 1970s high technology, which of course was not available in World War II. So they tried. They built a couple of variants. On one side, we have an armored personnel carrier variant, and on the other side, they decided to make a basically a light tank. Now missing from this is the 90 millimeter cockerel gun that would ordinarily be on it, but you get the general idea. The difference, of course, being that the engine is towards the front of the PC and towards the back of the 90. They gave the vehicle the snappy title of Cobra. And they are to be found in the collection of the War Heritage Institute in Belgium. Which is kind of not surprising for a Belgian company, really, but okay. So this is going to be a, a pretty quick little scoot around. There's actually not all that much inside, but it is at least an interesting example of trying something different. So at the back, you get a good view of the rubber tr band track. Now, if you look here, you're going to see metal hinges. So there's a link here with a couple of metal hinges on the side. This is a segmented track. So if you have to pull it off, you can undo the hinges, but most of the track uh, the links or the, the pads are banded together. The pads, of course, are bolted in. They can be removed. You will also note that the vehicle is swimmable without preparation. You have your screws on each side. You have rudders to control your direction. The taillight looks very American, but it is made by uh, uh, ETS uh, Gabriel of Lyon. And then you come across a very large back door. Now this is actually not as thick as it looks because if you open it up, you'll see that it's inset into which you're going to find the air conditioning system, window at the back. And as you look forward, you can see the crew compartment, which is reasonably spacious for the, for the vehicle. I mean, if you think about what the other competitors of the era are in the late 1970s, so and this is still the M113 era, the Bradleys and so on haven't come out yet. Uh, and under here in these two little boxes, and they are little, but yay big, well, that's where the magic happens. That's where your motors are to be located. And then further forward, you got the crew compartment for the vehicle crew itself, driver and commander slash bow gunner, and the engine in the middle. So let's have a quick look under here. Uh, oh, as I quickly look up, you got a, a roof hatch, which flips up and back onto these rubber bullets, radio antenna. And let's have a look inside. Now, remember, as we're looking in here, this is basically an engineering prototype. It, did come with a mounting for a turret. There is actually a couple of different types of turrets you could put on, but mainly it was a 12.7 machine gun. Or a couple of ammo racks, it looks like at the back. Fire extinguishers, well, even in the developmental prototype, that might catch fire. Uh, but it's obviously absent a lot of the stowage and materials, you know, radios, whatever, that you would ordinarily find in a combat vehicle. But again, they're just showing whether or not this works. So I'm sitting on the bench sheet. There's no uh, seat belts or anything else to hold you in place. You can lift up as near as we can tell. There's compartments underneath here that you would use hex keys to open these up and uh, you can access whatever's underneath. We think at least under one of them is going to be where the batteries are because we've been looking for a few minutes. We haven't been able to find them. At least not over anything that we can open up. They're not under that, uh, that box, by the way. 
Now, of course, one of the advantages to having an electrical system is that you can place the engine in a different place to the motors, uh, and you don't need to have room for a power shaft like you did on the, on say, Sherman's. Uh, oh, as a uh, final note, uh, there is actually a mechanical final drive between the motor and the sprocket wheel. It doesn't just go straight from motor in. Anyway, so the engine is at the front center, and what we have under here is a Cummins VT378C. It's a 378 cubic inch, hence the name. Six-cylinder, water-cooled, diesel, constant speed engine. Runs at 3200 RPM. So there is an idle setting if you need to drop down the, the speed a little bit just because you're doing nothing. But if you're operating the vehicle, 3200 RPM, and that attaches to the alternator, which would ordinarily go where the flywheel is, and that puts out 110 kilowatts at about 600 volts. In the, I note the traditional yellow color, the Cummins seems to put its uh, engines in. Intake at the top, exhaust at the top. Fantastic. There was, there was another vehicle around here we saw that was similar and much worse laid out anyway so that's the engine um oh attached to the engine is the alternator that's the other important little thing that they have here it's a 110 kilowatt alternator so that is what provides the power to the rest of the vehicle so not only does it provide the power to the drivetrain it also provides power to the batteries that run everything else including and it's important to note this the hydraulic steering pumps which are electrically powered steering pumps. When this vehicle was undergoing its various testing regimens, uh, both in Belgium and in the US, it was sent to the US and tested by TACOM, uh, or at least under contract from TACOM. If there was a problem, it was probably an electrical problem. Uh, so, for example, there was a steering problem, if I recall, uh, the hydraulic pump was not pumping, which was traced to a fault in something to do with the electricity generation system. It's a bit like those, uh, everything is electrical. It's a bit like when, when Ferrari, there was a, an, an electrical fault in everything that, uh, that destroyed the car in the Formula One race back in the day. It's like, oh, the, the piston ring blew and the piston evacuated itself out of the out of the uh, the piston head evacuated out of the piston and it destroyed the alternator on its way out of the car and that caused the electrical fault that caused the retirement of the car uh, all right so we have down below here an electrical control panel battery control slave start so they had a little bit of difficulty moving this once and apparently what they did was they had a CVRT like a scorpion or a scimitar uh, behind and they ran a slave cable from the scimitar to this and it worked a bit like a leash. It provided enough electricity that the motors would work slowly so they were able to drive this thing slowly forward with the scimitar following along closely behind within the length of the jumper cable and uh, they were able to get the vehicle around the maintenance bay, which actually is very, very clever if you think about it, uh, especially in confined spaces like where you might be repairing things. All right, so the other two positions, the commander's position, well, he's got himself a bow machine gun, yay. And well, then there's the driver. So to get into the driver, I think I'm, it's probably a lot easier for me. There. Trying to figure out if it's hinged. It looks like it might be hinged, but it's probably easier for me just to get out and come down the top. All right, so the PC variant. Well, again, remember this is a developmental prototype, so some features may not make sense, like very large optics for the driver and commander. You would think ordinarily that, well, you're talking something with a little bit more ballistic protection. Uh, unless this is the desired level of ballistic protection, it's not very much, uh, in which case the thin metal here would be equaled by the thick glass there. Anyway, just one of those design considerations to worry about. Spare track pads. Uh, so you got three spare track pads at the front. Remember, these are pads that are bolted onto the, uh, the track, they're not individual track links. Your usual array of service headlight, convoy marker, low-vis headlight, indicator. 
Airflow through the engine compartment is simple enough. Comes in through the front, the radiator is located here, the fan goes through the engine and then out alongside the exhaust. Now remember this thing is supposed to be amphibious without preparation. Well, there is one piece of preparation on the control panel in the driver's compartment. There's a toggle switch, it says splashboard, up or down. And the splashboard here, you can see there's a slot and it comes all the way up to prevent the vehicle from basically submerging itself with its forward motion. Uh, I do note that the exhaust pipe, somebody's taken a little bit of time to give it a sort of a, a nicely polished finish just uh, to make it stand out. You know, I guess they can't do chrome. That's, that was the Chevy car I did a while back. Uh, but uh, anyway, so wing mirrors and that is the front. If you look at the side where well, you got the fuel filler port, a single optic again, and well, that's it until you get to the, the tracks and the five road wheels per side. To save a little bit of space on the inside, they've gone for external coil springs. And there are also shock absorbers on the front and last arm just to stop it from rocking perpetually. Uh, but it was never really enough. The suspension was a little bit too springy and made people sick. Ow. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. What about the Belgians in their tiny driver's positions? Okay, well, once you're in, it gets a lot better, at least in the up position. I wonder if this seat will go down. There's all sorts of creepy crawlies and spiders in here, hang on. I hope the hell the seat does go down because there's not much there, hang on. Right, uh, it turns out that I'm kind of stuck in the up position because everything in this vehicle is electric, but why not? You've got a big electrical generator. And that includes the seat adjustment. You push a button and the seat goes up or down or whatever. What strikes me as being needlessly complicated and probably not should be implemented into a combat vehicle. That said, the LAV3, I remember the driver's seat is powered. Anyway, uh, so I'm sitting in the obviously raised position. Uh, to my front, I have a single pedal, the accelerator. Under my left foot is a button. Nobody seems to know quite what the button does. I mean, it's just like one of those headlight uh, high beam, low beam switches on an old American car. I can't imagine that's what it's for, but it, it's very much there. Uh, the controls, uh, it, it almost reminds me a little bit of a Yay Panzer 38T. The, the steering controls are horizontal, very close together, and yeah, you pull one, you pull the other, you pull both to stop. Not a massive range of motion. Uh, the steering is hydraulic, so the, uh, the electricity power is a hydraulic pump which then goes through. Now, slow speed steering and testing was found to be very good. High speed steering was a bit problematic because you had such a small range of motion on the tillers that you could very easily oversteer or overcompensate in your pull and going in the correct direction was a little bit on the difficult side. So it did not get great marks for testing in the realm of high speed steering. Now the vehicle would do over 40 miles an hour and testing in the US it was 41 miles an hour. Uh, uh, the uh, ACAC uh, said it was going to do 47 miles an hour, which if you translate those to kilometers, it's like 70 and 77 uh, kilometers an hour. Quite fast. The other problem with the small size of the vehicle is that apparently it rode very, I'm not going to say rough, but uh, rocking. Uh, you, you, would, you might have a little bit of motion sickness by the time you were done. Uh, maximum uh, acceleration, if you're curious, they measured that. Zero to 20 in about 4.8 seconds. That's miles an hour, not kilometers, uh, because I haven't seen any, any other tests. 
and it will climb a 28 inch vertical wall which isn't all that much by armored vehicle standards uh, but that was the limit as far how, how far it will go anyway other controls on the right hand side there's a large black lever is your rev control lever uh, so as, uh, as i said you can have it either in constant speed or a lower idle if necessary and you could, in theory, if you really wanted to fine control the vehicle, you'd set it for low idle, you wouldn't get too much power, and you, you could do some fine control that way. On the left-hand side, the master control box, and then the control panel. So the speedo goes up to 120. A uh, rev counter clocks out at 40. The drive selector is a little bit weird. So it's got a four-position drive, up, down, left, and right. It's a little bit weird, but uh, in any case, we, we can think uh, from speaking with somebody who drove this 30 something years ago, and his memory on the matter is a little bit fuzzy, uh, is that the left and right drives are for neutral steers. So you, you put the drive into that arrow, then hit the accelerator and the, uh, the brake handle to do your neutral steer in that direction. Uh, transmission on or off, uh, that's what we got, no, turn signals, yeah, right, right at the bottom there's the indicator for the turn signals, driving lights, uh, the speedo says it's done 786 kilometers, that's a reasonable amount of testing for, for one out of uh, a series of, I think it was five prototypes built all in all. Right. <sighs> I think that's about it for the PC. Let's have a, a quick gander at the light tank. I don't think we're going to spend quite as much time at it. All right, so that's the PC. Of course, they have conveniently parked next to it a light tank. So hopping in the turret, well, obviously we are missing the 90 millimeter cockerel gun, but it does still allow us to make some observations. Uh, the turret design, by the way, I, I think has been developed to a current production cockerel turret. Uh, but anyway, so two-man crew in the turret. So we think, presumably, because the manual handle is on the right-hand side, that I'm seated on the gunner's position and the commander is on the left. And there's another reasonable reason why that might be the case. The handles themselves are kind of the British type with a fixed control and a thumb switch, which I was never a fan of the thumb switch. I don't have the fidelity. If you ever see me playing an Xbox game, I will lose. Uh, but on the plus side, it does mean that you can hold on to the handle for stability and you are less likely to make false inputs as this small light vehicle is bouncing around. Two buttons, one says laze, one says track. I guess they had a track option. Uh, a couple of toggle switches for coax and main gun. The TC's side, I note, has uh, the actual control for toggle. Uh, and there's one also for the fan and the spotlight. The spotlight is, uh, <laughs> is on a, under a, do you really want to use this guard? Now, if you look to the rear, you see the ammunition is stowed both vertically, directly behind the two crewmen. There's two, four, six, eight, ten. Looks like 12 standing vertically. And then another mm, 18, give or take, 19. Uh, are stowed horizontally in the bustle. Uh, so the commander, of course, is the one who has the joy of loading the gun, which, I mean, for instance, it's, it's not exactly new to the Belgians. They did that with the Scorpion. And uh, indeed, t and the, the DF-90 that they're using today, I believe it's still a two-man and one guy has to physically ram it in. Uh, but again, because you are ramming in, especially if you're doing it from a seated position, uh, it would be useful if you could use your dominant hand to do the ramming, which is, of course, the guy sitting on the left. So he will grab the round, place it down, and ram it in. I can't tell you very much about the rest of this because <laughs> there's not much in it. There's no indication as where the radio goes, for example. Uh, I, actually, I really don't know where the radio would go. Uh, there is a mount in the hull, so it's possible it's in the hull, you'd have to send the uh, send a signal through the junction box or the, the slip rings, uh, which seems a little annoying, and altering the radio is also going to be annoying if your turret is not facing in the correct direction. 
but uh, that's, that's basically what we have inside the turret. The driver's position is a little odd. There is a tunnel that you can use to get into the driver's position if you don't want to use the hatch. But of course, the turret does need to be facing the correct direction. Right, so having a look at the driver's compartment, I don't feel like ruining a perfectly good jumper any more than it already is. Uh, so what you have to do is get in through the hatch and then you slide to the right. To the right of the driver, you're going to see pretty much the same control panel as you'd seen inside the other Cobra, which makes a little bit of sense. Complete with the big black handle for adjusting the revs. The seat does seem to be a little bit more rational, as in it doesn't have uh, electrical controls. On the other hand, it also does look kind of fixed in place. But, uh, unfortunately, although the motors on this vehicle are at the front, because of course the engine is at the back on this tank equivalent, uh, you can't access them, you can't see them, so I can't show you what they look like. Uh, automotively, the, the vehicle is pretty much the same. Right, so there you go. All right, so the vehicles, of course, were only development prototypes for the concept. So should they have entered service, doubtless it would have gotten a lot more testing and fixed a lot of the little niggles, such as the difficult steering at high speed. Some of the technical problems, they, well, they never worked out. So in testing, there were a few breakdowns that were eventually traced to the electrics. As an experiment, well, it didn't go anywhere. The, it was uh, an interesting idea. In the American testing, they got a whole bunch of drivers who tried out the PC, and then they said, okay, compared to other vehicles you have driven, such as M113A3, M113A2, M551, M60, and M1, is this better or worse in the following characteristics? And it turned out that the M113 A2 and A3 were better than or as good as the Cobra in most respects. Now, yes, electric motors still retained when they worked their characteristics of very high torque, great acceleration, low speed control, and a fuel economy. This thing had a fuel range of somewhere over 600 kilometers, which for the standards of the time, and even by the standards of the day, is pretty damn reasonable. But of course, it was a developmental dead end. We are still to this day kicking around the idea of electric motors, but for the same reason that they, they kept coming into fashion throughout armored vehicle history, they're still going out of fashion. We'll get there one day, I am sure. But in the meantime, these two vehicles are a monument to a little bit of Belgian engineering ingenuity and adventurism. So again, a, a thank you to the War Heritage Institute of Belgium for showing off these two vehicles of theirs. Hope you found it interesting and informative, and I'll talk to you on the next one. The other problem, but though with the small size, I'm going to sneeze now, hang on. <coughs> <coughs>